right, it's time for Talk and Track right here as part of the Big Play Network, my race source. So happy to have you alongside. I am Matt Fontana, Ryan Stillman with us as well for our debut episode to get into everything horse racing with my racehorse. Big week coming up with the Breeders' Cup. We're going to get into all that with Ryan, discuss some of the big horses out there. Joe Moran going to stop by, horse racing manager, to even get some more insight there. But Ryan, as we kick this whole thing off, just kind of want to give some people a little insight to what we're going to do here with Talk and Track. We aim to be informational. We want to get a lot of the information out there on some of the horses, but really it's also introducing people potentially to my racehorse. Now, if you're watching this, you might say, well, I already get the newsletter and maybe I'm involved with some horses here and there, but tell Ryan everybody about what my racehorse is and kind of what we're doing here uh, with this podcast. Yeah, thanks, Matt. So happy to do this show. I'm really pumped for uh, this, the future of this. I think it's great. My racehorse is the biggest inflection point in horse racing that we've seen yet. You know, we're talking about ownership groups and if you look at the history of horse racing, Matt, it really used to be that there were big names like Vanderbilt, Whitney, Calumet Farm, and you had to be just the richest of the rich to own horses. It was just a, a select club. Um, and, and my racehorse is trying to make it so that you can be a part of that action. And they've won a Kentucky Derby. They've won a Preakness this year. And what you're able to do is buy fractional micro shares of great promising horses and as they uh, go forward in their careers, you get to be a part of the journey. When they win, you win a percentage of the money. Um, and what's really neat about this is when these horses go and they get into the winner circle at the Preakness, you get a chance to stand in the winner circle at the Preakness. It's, it's one of these really cool things in sports because you really can say, I own this horse. And when horses, if you've ever owned it or know people who've owned it, they're very expensive. They can get sick. They, they have things go wrong you don't pay a dime after mm. you pay your initial fee and you still make money. And it's, it's like the best bet you could ever make. It, it's, it's fun. It's, it's great. But what we're trying to do is there's not a place where all that information is just in one show, right, Matt? We really want to become a hub where we have exclusive interviews, keep you updated on the latest things, all grounded around my racehorse, but we'll cover racing in general and where those horses are within the, the scope of the year of it. Um, and, and it's just a great place for you guys to be able to ask questions to the big people at my racehorse, Michael Barons, um, Joe Moran, the trainers. Hopefully we get all these people on, but we want to be that place. This is a great community. There's hundreds of thousands of you out there, and we want to be able to bring us all together even more as we go on this journey. You know, I'm on it too, Ryan, because I am a part owner of Improbable Luck, which is just like insane to say, but it was $60. There's always the risk of loss, you know, things like that, but I just love it. Because I can be a part of it. I get the updates on Improbable Luck where I talk a lot about him and his breeze and where he's kind of at in his career. You follow along, but it was $60 and I'm in. And I just think it is so cool where, like you said, I'm hands off. I don't need to worry about, you know, that's on D. Wayne Lucas and crew to get it done. I'm not actually involved in anything. Get a little piece of it. And I think it's a great gifting idea for a lot of people out there if you're looking for a great gift of somebody that's involved in the horse racing. But you mentioned it. This is really revolutionary. This is new. This is on the forefront of what the future might be. Well, there's always going to be horses out there that are privately owned or a bunch of rich people only own the horse. But now it is a group of us. We're kind of all involved. And that's exactly what we want to do here on Talking Track, where I'm a part of owner from Probable Luck. I want the updates on Probable Luck. I get the newsletters. I get the video. But we're aiming to take it a little step further with it here on the podcast, which is going to be so awesome, which is why it's great to have Ryan with us on this journey to get on to all that. So part of that, a big race coming up, big set of races coming up, is the Breeders' Cup. So now we're going to run through a few different horses. We'll get our Improbable Luck update. Governor Sam, Straight No Chaser, Seize the Gray, which is probably one of the marquee horses uh, with my racehorse coming up in a second. But, uh, Ryan, let's talk about the Breeders' Cup. So for the average people out there, they probably hear about the Triple Crown, and they think, oh, horse racing's done for the year. Not the case at all. And you had a great analogy for me talking about the Breeders' Cup. This is kind of like the Olympics, uh, for, for horse racing and for a lot of the owners. Explain to everybody what's going on uh, with the Breeders' Cup coming up. Yeah, absolutely. I, and Matt, I'm so excited to talk about this because the Breeders' Cup for me is the most exciting two days in the entire calendar year for horse racing. And in case you guys are new to it or you don't know where to find it, it's going to be on November 1st and 2nd. It's going to be streaming on, on Peacock and all over the place. And you don't want to miss, miss it. And you said it perfectly, Matt. This is the Olympics of horse racing. This is an event that attracts many of the world's most elite thoroughbred racehorses. 
Um, and you know how if you go to the Olympics, there's sprinters, there's long distance runners, there's all different types. Well, they're same with horse racing, right? There's there's sprinters, there's 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 milers, there's horses that want to go the classic distance, there's fillies and mares, there's there's colts and geldings. Every category you can basically want to see is going to be competing here for millions of dollars. And every single race is sort of its own championship race, especially this year. This year happens to be one of the deepest overall Breeders' Cups we've ever seen. Almost every category for a championship is up for grabs. Um, it started in 1984. It got bigger and bigger. There's been moments that are the most iconic in the sport, like when Zenyatta ran and became horse of the uh, year, even in a loss. I mean, th th that's what's amazing about this. Your horse can can build an entire year up to this, try to win the horse of the year, which is the most coveted championship you can get in horse racing and lose it or, or win it based on what they do here. And I'm so excited this year because Big Play and My Racehorse have a few horses who are actually contending. I mean, how exciting could that be? You mentioned it too about the millions online. Just look at the purse. That'll tell you how big this race or this series of races is going to be. And as you said, there are some horses that are going to win Horse of the Year and then they're off to stud or they're off to move on. But the other side of that, there are some young horses that'll get you the primer for the Triple Crown next year, horses that are just beginning their career on out. So that's why it's a lot to look at here coming up and you mentioned it my racehorse big play we've got several different horses involved now let's start with the one horse that is not going to be involved and that is improbable luck uh a young horse that we're excited about is one of the ones that i'm the part owner and ryan a lot of the updates i've been getting on him he is now down at churchill his breezes are going well he's going through gate training which i saw just give the quick update on probable luck and maybe explain to some people out there what a breeze is and why that is so important as far as his training goes yeah, absolutely. So Improbable Luck is coming along very nicely. And we're talking about him because he's a big part of Big Play, which is our network over here. And and that's kind of our boy, Improbable Luck. He's so, my boy, Ryan. I'm in, man. I got my little piece of him. I'm hoping for the best for him, all right? Well, you, you've hitched your, your, your wagon to a really exciting horse, to be Glad honest. Glad to hear that. I mean, he, he, well, he's coming along really nicely. He just had his fifth workout from the gate, and we'll talk about all of this. So his first four workouts were what we call breezes. And if you're new to horse racing, a breeze is just another name for a workout. They're they're working out the horse. Um, and and he is he's doing great. He's coming along in his fifth workout. He he learned how to basically run from the starting gate. And this is huge, Matt, because Horses win and lose races sometimes based on how they perform at the starting gate. I mean, it's critical. A bad start can cost you everything. Fortunately, uh, his workout went well, and he's in the hands of, honestly, a guy that you can consider one of the greatest trainers, if not the greatest trainer that ever walked the earth, D. Wayne Lucas. And he's all reports are doing well. It, it's just these little steps in a horse's life that all lead up to him finally making the races. And it's fun. I think that we're all getting to see it in real time and be along for the ride. Don't you? I love it. Cause I get the newsletter updates, which again, if you go to my race horse again, unfortunately, improbable luck, there's no more shares, but all, a lot of the horses we will talk about here on the podcast or give you some insight on ones that are available. It's not only this podcast, but I'm getting weekly updates, weekly videos, weekly pictures of how he's doing. And I, again, it's not that I'm involved necessarily, but I think it's interesting. And, and to get those positive reports that it's going well, as you said, with the breezes and I got some of the times and it's going, hey, as times are coming down or his workouts are getting better. It really is a lot of fun uh, coming up with that. Um, he's pointing there for the Breeders' Cup Juvenile as well. So we can tell everybody kind of maybe what are the next steps? His training is going well. Kind of what do we expect out of improbable luck over the maybe the next couple of weeks or so? Well, I think you're just going to see more more works from Lucas with him, mm -hmm. and you're going to see him start to improve with each of them. It's it's all these little things that you do to an athlete. You're trying to work a horse's mind. You're trying to work their body. You're trying to not ruin them as well. I mean, a, a lesser trainer than Lucas might just say, yeah, keep sprinting them, and the, a horse can can mentally kind of fry out there. You could He could buck a shin. But it's going to be a process, a slow process. You'll see slow works followed by fast works, gate works, racing in company, all sorts of stuff. And, you know, you mentioned the Breeders' Cup juvenile for him. Well, of course, that that race, so Improbable Luck is a two-year-old right now. And everybody who has a two-year-old probably dreams of running in the Kentucky Derby when their horse turns three. So this year, the Breeders' Cup Juvenile is going to be taking place. And what's exciting about that is that field is going to be basically, look, this is the group of horses that could run in next year's Kentucky Derby, right? Now, I, I have a feeling 
improbable luck had had he been able to train and get to the races sooner and all this maybe this would be where he ended up because this is the creme de la creme of the dirt horses right but it's okay uh you don't have to have made it here to to be that in fact most of the time the kentucky derby winner does not run in this race in fact it's only been one twice wow okay so like that's right we're talking about there is there's a race that he could be in these are going to be his contemporaries these are going to be the ones he's up against but i love that like you said there this is maybe actually a good thing that again we all got to see how it plays out but it doesn't necessarily mean kentucky derby success if they don't run this fall in that in in the juvenile in the breeders cup absolutely matt You, you put it really well there because this race will will probably decide who the champion three-year-old uh, male is the colt mm-hmm. or gelding but the, the the thing is only two horses since 1984 when they've run this race have went on to win this race and the kentucky derby sometimes mm-hmm. they've been runners up sometimes sure. they've been you know there's there's been other things that have happened but more or less this doesn't always dictate your success down the road because racing's hard it's just like any athlete right you know you can your season can get ruined and you only get one shot at the derby but this year you're gonna want to tune into the breeders cup juvenile since i've followed it this is the best field i've ever seen wow really really Honestly. now oh, part of that no field doubt. is a tie to improbable luck tell us about governor sam who's his half brother well he okay let's we can switch there for a second sure. probable luck they they say half brothers governor sam uh what they're talking about when they say that he's not technically a half brother but what they mean by it when they're saying it is his sire governor sam and improbable luck sire are both the same horse improbable and uh governor sam is going to be running in the the grass version of the breeders cup juvenile mm. um it's called the juvenile turf and and governor sam is a serious serious contender he's the best son we've seen yet of improbable um he he sped his opening fraction in 20 and change in his last race and that is extremely fast for a two-year-old i mean we're talking really lightning fast uh his trainer is a guy named george weaver who was an assistant trainer to d wayne lucas um, so this guy knows how to get a horse to run. He's he's won over in Dubai. He's won over in, in at Royal Ascot. This horse has a serious chance of winning. So it's kind of cool to see. Perhaps we'll see a son of Improbable, just like our own Improbable Luck, do something phenomenal and win a world championship over at the Breeders' Cup. But it's going to be a tough race. There's big mojos over there. There's a horse from Japan who looks like a beast. But yeah, you'll definitely want to tune into the Breeders' Cup juvenile turf to see if Governor Sam can uh, be Improbable's first Breeders' Cup winning son. So my racehorse, uh, our involvement was Straight No Chaser. So tell me about the Breeders' Cup sprint, and then tell me about Straight No Chaser, who is a my racehorse horse that's going to be in that, uh, his chances, and just really kind of maybe what the difference of the sprint is versus some of the other races. Sure. The the Breeders' Cup sprint is a shorter distance. Like, like I'm going to make it very simple for all. It's, you know, it's sprinters, you know, mm-hmm. you say in both. It's just smaller distance versus miles and mile and a quarter and different distances that you're going to see. So this horse is by far one of my, my favorite horses in training, actually, just because he's such he's got such a good story. So this is this is the first of two my race horses that are in the Breeders' Cup. Uh, that have a chance to win. So straight no chaser, he's trained by a man named Dan Blacker, who's, this guy is a real horseman. Uh, Dan was an assistant to a guy named Richard Mandela, who's one of the greatest horsemen who's ever lived. Uh, Matt, back in the day, the Breeders' Cup, now it's two-day event, but it used to be where it was seven races in one day. I remember, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You remember? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Richard Mandela once won four of those seven in one (laughs) single year. Like, that's how good this guy is. So Dan, he knows what he's doing. And this has been an incredible training job. You know, Dan's allowed this horse to mature and come into his best self. A lot of people, they get a horse, they're like, I want my money right away. I want I want to get him out there. I want to go to the derby, push him. He's not ready. Nope. Dan waited till this horse was three, got him started, and he, and he started figuring him out. He found the perfect distance for this horse, which was sprinting. And he even figured out the best surf, uh, surface for him. He started on the turf, got him to the dirt. You can, you can see this horse's history. You can see this man tinkering every race, figuring how far does he want to go? Where's the class for him? And last year, straight no chaser, he just really began to peak. He won this thing called the Maryland Sprint Stakes at Pimlico on the Preakness undercard by seven and a half lanes. And he looked like one of the best sprinters in the country. I mean, this horse was freaky. And unfortunately, this happens in racing. You get so excited and... The horse is injured shortly thereafter. So he he couldn't return to the races for almost a year. So he came back this year, 
And uh, first race, he came back in Aqueduct. Everyone was excited. He stumbled at the start, lost. Looked very disappointing. I got to imagine he was heartbroken. And then everything turned around. In his next race, which was his most recent, he came back and won the Santa Anita Sprint Championships by six and a quarter lengths. I believe it was the fastest running of that race since 2014. And this has a very, you know, nice history. Of course, uh, you know, Roy H was in there who went on to win a Breeders' Cup. And before he ran faster than that horse on his final time. Um, he wasn't in hit racing with them, but I'm saying these horses that have had success from this to go win Breeders' Cups. Mm -hmm. So the point is, this is a, a freakish looking horse. He's a serious runner and he'll be running the Breeders' Cup sprint, sprint as a real contender. But, you know, you talked about who's he facing. Matt, this is a tough field. You've got Mullion, you've got Skelly, Federal Judge. You have a horse from Japan who's one of the best in the world at sprinting named Rimak or Rimaki or Remake. It's it's hard to tell, but he's going to be there. It's in and so is a horse named Nakatani who ran third in this race last year against two monsters. Raging Torrent is another one who's tough, but he is right there. He has uh, every chance to to win this thing. Um, so it's exciting. We might see a, a, a my racehorse walk away with a, a Breeders' Cup Sprint Championship this year. And I think the great thing off of that is, Ryan, that people are involved with that. Yeah, we all want to win the Kentucky Derby, the Triple Crown, but that's still a win for you as an owner of my racehorse. And that's being a part of one of the horses. It are It is some of these other ones. So, again, you mentioned the ones at Pimlico and some of the other tracks that they're at. Those are all still wins that stack up. That's all important. It's where for the novice person out there yeah we understand the triple crown you might even know the breeders cup we understand that horse racing is year round and if you are involved with one of these horses it's not just four races a year there are a lot of other ones that they can enter for big purses and that's just a prime example with straight no chaser as he gets ready to go for the breeders cup sprint now for my race source the crown jewel at this point has got to be seized the gray he's going to be running that weekend as well do you think it's the classic or the mile where do you think seize the gray is going to kind of fit in here for the breeders cup and his chance to take home some hardware well what's exciting is they've announced it officially yesterday pre-entries came out which means like here's where i want to go and you can find out exactly where he's headed we have some news here he is headed to the breeders cup dirt mile mile okay but honestly, this is exciting. Now, last year, the horse who won this race, he went on to be horse of the year, Matt, uh, a horse named Cody's Wish. So, I mean, this is it's it's going to be a tough task, but it, there's a lot on the line and exciting. And, you know, look, we love Seize the Gray over here at, at Big Play. Uh, Ken Miles, who's a, a big play guy, he he owns this horse. I mean, this is this is his boy. He owns a part of him, a big part of him. And he's really become the people's horse, right? We were talking at the beginning about fractional ownership, and I want to clarify something. There have been ownership groups before in horse racing, right? But it's incredible what my racehorse has done. I think they've taken it to that next level where you really saw, wait, I can actually go to the big dances with these guys. Mm -hmm. They've won the Breeders' Cup Classic, the Kentucky Derby, the Preakness, and sees the gray. Here's what he's got on the line. He has a championship for three-year-old male and possibly horse of the year if things fall his way. But really the three-year-old championship is what he's got at stake. And he has a really good chance here, uh, Matt. I mean, look, it's a wide open race. There's a horse named National Treasure who it, it looks like he's going to be a tough customer. Now, Seize the Gray won the Preakness this year. National Treasure won last year's Preakness. And he was second by a, like a, a slim nose to last year's horse of the year in this race, Cody's Wish. There's some interesting stuff going on with National Treasure. As of this recording, he has not been working out since his last race. So he might not make this race, which opens up the field even more. Now, that that could be good for Seize the Gray. You don't want that to happen to a horse, but of course, that's the reality of racing. So with that open, Seize the Gray's, I think the, the field, the, the, the horses he needs to worry about, domestic product, post time, Saudi crown, there's some more, but those are like some of the big ones I'd worry about. But Seize the Gray is a... Greekness, Pat Day Mile, and Pennsylvania Derby winner. And he has a real shot of winning this. And how cool would that be, Matt, if he wins this and, and the horse he's competing with for championships, Fierceness loses and throws in a clunker, which he's very capable of doing. And we're sitting there at the end of Saturday. This is the final race of the Breeders' Cup, the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile. And we're sitting there and my racehorses, big play zone, you know, the horse we love, Seize the Gray, is a champion racehorse. 
champion. Like, again, individual races, things like that. But to be that horse of the year, to be the champion of the year would be absolutely incredible. And what a boost, again, to my racehorse. And, and that's the cool thing about what we're going to do here, Ryan. We're going to talk about some other horses coming up in a sec. We're also going to catch up with Joe Moran, horse manager, discuss all that. But that's the exciting thing about my racehorse is when you can get in on the ground level of horses like that. And I want to give my racehorse a lot of credit for this as well and Ken and the whole team because – and I joke and I say th th they're not finding dud horses like they're in this to find the horses to become champions to win races uh, and to be involved. And I just think a little bit so much about watching the Breeders' Cup and and getting involved. And again, I know probable luck's not there, but if you were a part of Seize the Gray to watch that, the excitement of that. And again, you're involved for a, a share. You know, I might tell I, I $60 was the share to get involved in a probable luck. And as it goes on, we're going to, a part of this podcast moving forward, we'll be telling people about the new My Racehorses that are available and all that. Uh, but I just think that's so cool. And, and it comes back to, again, My Racehorse finding and picking the right horses, picking the right trainers, and really sparing no expense to get these horses to an elite level of horse racing. You, you couldn't have put it better. I mean, that's it. And look, it's so fun. Matt, this is your first time owning it. How, how much fun are you having? How much excitement is this bringing you? It's a lot. And I can only imagine next year, if improbable, like, which again, that's always the risk of this, of you never know how it's going to go. But to say, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to watch a Triple Crown race. And I, it's not just I placed a bet, you know, on, 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 a, on a horse racing app. Like, that's my guy. That's my horse right there. But it's the follow-up. It's to know he's doing well in his training or to follow the workouts and, and all that. And then the other thing about my racehorse, and especially with us here at Big Play, it's the events. It's the opportunity to go to a race. It's an opportunity for us. I know we're going to do a lot of big events here for some of the big races coming up where you can come and be a part of the group of everybody else cheering on the horse. It's so awesome. It's so exciting. I, I, I love it so much. Well, a big part of this week, obviously, are the trainers, but also the managers and one of the big names out there, Joe Moran. Ryan caught up with them as we get ready to go for the Breeders' Cup. Here's Ryan. Sit down with Joe Moran. Hello, everyone at Big Play. We are here today with, with someone you've got to meet if you love my racehorse, uh, Joe Moran, head of racing and bloodstock. Joe, thank you so much for coming on the show. Ryan, it's a, it's a pleasure. Uh, thrilled about the partnership that we got going on here and uh, exciting times for my racehorse right now. Absolutely. And, and when you talk big play and you talk my racehorse, you, you can't start anywhere else but improbable luck. So how is it like to be around this horse? You know, I saw him obviously at the sale when we had purchased him. Uh, and then I actually just had the opportunity of seeing him uh, on Wednesday when Cesar Gray had his final breeze. Um, he is, I like to explain two-year-olds as teenagers. They go, all of them go through a teenager phase at a different time. And he's one that's uh, going through his teenager phase at the time. He's kind of a little bit rambunctious. He's a big, powerful colt. Uh, when you look at him, comparing him to some other horses, he though he's been on the work tab for some time now, he still has ways to go, in my opinion. He's got plenty of weight on him. And that's a good thing moving forward. And I think that's what's going to help him down the road is that weight is no problem on him. But he's got a powerful hip on him, powerful shoulder, uh, and just got great size to him. Uh, as I said, he's a little rambunctious. So I think mentally is just where we're a little behind with him. But I think as you're seeing, I thought today's breeze was actually one of his better breezes, even though um, he's maybe not quite exactly where we wanted him or expected him at this stage. Uh, I think he's trending in the right direction. And we saw it a couple of weeks ago when he worked at worked out of the gate. Uh, he was having a little troubles there of, of just mentally handling that because for horses they're going into a small space and it is a lot on them mentally and they have to overcome things like that um and it took some time they finally got him to work from the gate uh, and he didn't break great but uh baz the assistant he said you know right after that work they took him back and he walked in like a professional and then that second time he did it a lot better so you'll see certain horses are able to do different tasks at just different speeds and i think you're just seeing that he's maybe taking a little bit longer than we expected but in the end he's making good progress um, and I would expect to see him uh, be in the entry box before the end of the year, for sure. Interesting. Are you guys kind of, it looked like circling November, possibly for a start for him? Yeah, you know, with Wayne, it's it's very, and with two-year-olds in general, I think each work's going to give you a sign. There's going to be one work where the snap of the finger, you say, okay, he's ready. Um, and Wayne, for example, is not one that is necessarily 
in it to win first time out. He's an old school trainer that uses that first race for experience. And we always say one race is equivalent to four work. So he would sometimes rather run a horse than working him four times. And he's going to get a lot more experience and then also get that race experience of what it's like um, by doing that. Um, at the same time, I still think there's a good chance that he could run in the second book at uh, Churchill Downs, which would be the end of November. If not, uh, I don't think it would be a bad thing just based off his progress right now, even if we just delayed it a little bit and looked at Oaklawn uh, in December. And I just think the time with him is just going to continue to get better with, with time. How important is it for you guys at My Racehorse to allow a horse to develop, like what you're seeing on the journey with Improbable Luck? For sure. I, I, I think it is a crucial part, and especially with these young horses. A lot of times when we buy horses, just like we did with Improbable Luck, we purchase them from a two-year-old in training sale, we immediately like to give them time off. When they go through that intense atmosphere and demand of what they're required to do in those sales, they need to be let down and just be a horse for a little bit before they go back in the demands of the racetrack because it's a whole different atmosphere. So I think the time for them is a, a very important aspect and the one thing I'll say is, you know, if you rush a horse to get to the races and they have a poor experience in that debut or they're not prepared for the paddock or a crowd on that certain day, you can really set them back, you know, months down the road. So I, I just think you're always one. We listen to our trainers. Our trainers are the ones working with them every single day. But I think from what we could see on, on a weekly basis from the reports that we get uh, and the videos that you guys see that we pass along is that you just, you got to listen to the horse. They're going to tell you when they're ready. As long as they're sound and happy, keep them going until they're ready to get in the starting gate. And I just think it's going to give us such a better chance for his long-term longevity uh, and success down the road as well. So it sounds like you, you'd say, you know, everything's progressing nicely. Absolutely. And, and, and even Baz said, you know, not to say I was worried by any means, but like I said, when we had purchased him, Maybe I would have thought he would be a run already. He just gave you that vibe of he had that mature physical look to him that I thought he would be able to handle the pressure, which he's handled the pressure perfectly fine physically. But the mental side is just what's I think held us back the most. But uh, he said each week he's improving. It's just at a slower pace than some of them. Is there anything you could give an exclusive on with this horse to our viewers? You know, I would say it would be more just my personal opinion or our team's personal opinion from what we've seen and, and I hate to rush to judgment on certain things. Uh, and he's by a first crop stallion and improbable. You know, the one thing that I've seen that I, I didn't necessarily think was going to be my opinion now is I wouldn't be surprised if this horse is going to enjoy the turf at some point in his career. Not that that's where he'll start, but watching the way he moves, the further that he's worked and things like that, it, it wouldn't be a surprising aspect if he ended up you know, just uh, evolving and becoming a better horse, even on the turf. So it's just something that's in the back of my head of just seeing as he continues to go. Um, otherwise, you know, it's just his personality around the barn. Uh, he's a boy, you know, he, he's, he's kind of that handful boy that's not afraid to play with you and it's all playful. Um, but he just doesn't realize he's a thousand pounds. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, speaking of, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier about horses that my racehorse allows to develop and grow into themselves. Let's talk about the first of your two Breeders' Cup entries, uh, Straight No Chaser, because he's going into the Breeders' Cup to me looking like he's got a legitimate chance of winning. Absolutely. I, I truly believe if he gets the trip that I think he wants, and I'll say he's a little bit of a finicky horse because speed is his weapon. He's very fast. He doesn't want to be fought and he wants to be able to travel in his own rhythm. So when he has to stop, start, stop, start, that's when we don't see his big efforts. But whenever he gets clean running, he fires these huge efforts. Um, he's come out of the race in great order. He's working great. I hate to say we're just kind of keeping him in bubble wrap. Not that he's not doing well, but it's just, you know, we've had so many setbacks with him that you just you just want him to get there so, so much and you know, I just truly believe he deserves the opportunity to prove himself in the Breeders' Cup, and we were hoping to have that chance last year. So he'll have his final work on Sunday, uh, shipped to Del Mar on Monday. Uh, I think when it comes to the big key, I'm just hoping he gets more of a mid to outside draw when it comes to post position, because I do think that's key for him. Um, 
in this Breeders' Cup field, there's going to be other horses that are fast, just like him. So he's going to get more pressure than he's gotten some of these other races. And just to kind of tail off what I was saying before of the type of trip I would like to see him get that I think we're going to see his best effort, I would just prefer to see an outside draw. I'd, I'd even rather see him be stuck four wide going in, you know, down the back stretch and be clear than being stuck on the inside pressured, trying to fight his way through a position. How do you like his chances in the Breeders' Cup? I know that's the trip you want to see. Are, are you as high on him as I am? I think he's one of the real contenders this year. Yeah, I mean, he was ranked the number one dirt sprinter in the country last year after that uh, after that Pimlico win. Uh, you know, the first race back this year at Belmont, he just never got the trip uh, that he wanted. And it was a lot to ask on us. Uh, we asked a lot out of the horse. It was not the ideal plan to send him on the road. First start back off the layoff. Uh, the races in California didn't go. So we had to put him on a flight to New York. And I think there was just so much that overwhelmed him. And it was a big ask on our part. He drew the rail on top of that, didn't break well. So I just think there was so much against him. And then he came back to prove himself uh, recently at Santa Anita. And he did it in a big way and just did it so easy. Johnny V gets along with him so well. He knows him. He's coming back to ride him back again in the Breeders' Cup. And I think that's a, a big part. The relationship of jockey uh, and horse goes a long way. One last thought on this. Is there any thoughts about what happens next? You know, could could we see him another year based on what happens here? It's a great question. I mean, I would say right now the plan is to run him next year. And with his speed, you kind of think is, think of the overseas races in February and March. It would be something for big money for sprinters. Uh, I think he'd be able to handle it. And I think he would flourish over those tracks with his speed. Uh, at the same time, if he was to win a race like the Breeders' Cup Sprint, I'm sure our phones would be be ringing uh, for other plans early on in the year. But I would say right now our intentions are to race him next year. Wow, that's awesome. And and that's, you know, exclusive to me. I, I'm, I'm pumped. Yeah, me too. So let's talk about a horse that I can't even imagine what it must mean to you to have picked out at the sales yourself. Seize the Gray. What made you pick this horse out at the sales? Yeah, it was, uh, you know, myself and Roderick Watchman. Roderick Watchman was our head of bloodstock at the time and uh, was with our team for a long time working the sales leading. Um, and he's very experienced in the game and has uh, done a lot in the game. Uh, and he was just a horse that we really loved. And, you know, I hate to say when it comes to my racehorse, we have to find horses that are sellable as well, right? So we found this arrogate colt at the time arrogate was hot uh he was gray on top of it but he was just beautifully made and, and the word that i always come back to describe him as balanced and when we look for a horse when they're balanced it also creates improvements for soundness when when horses are athletic and know how to use their body it's only going to help them as their the demands come uh at the racetrack uh and then also going to certain barns you're trying to find horses that are made certain ways that we think are going to fit certain programs. Uh, he developed into just this incredible looking horse. Uh, I had the opportunity to spend some time with him his first morning at Del Mar. And you just see the horse that he's become. Um, you're gambling a little bit when we're buying him as yearlings at that age, as we did at Saratoga, that he's going to turn into this horse, but he couldn't be a, a better looking specimen. And it's just, it, it's rewarding as well. And it's just awesome to see how many people that we've brought into this horse that are getting to get on this journey and experience it with us. Uh, it's amazing. When you pick a Preakness winner, does it just make you like even more hungry to find that next one? It's gotta be so thrilling. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's incredible. It, it it's hard to explain because we go to so many sales and I hate to say it when you're every horse you buy, you, you have this feeling on them that you believe that they can get to this point, but we all know how hard it is to get here, but it puts things in perspective of it's just a, a rewarding moment to kind of step back and say, wow, when all the madness is going out and we're really here. And there's so many other variables, you know, that you just got to tip your cap to Dwayne Lucas and his entire team. Um, and we've made some decisions of like the Penn Derby of pointing there. And Wayne was adamant on the Preakness. And I was sitting there scratching my head for a second saying, Gosh, we're at, we're asking a lot of them, you know, three races and a quick turnaround. But, uh, you know, taking those chances are what can put you on the big stage and, and make horses careers. Uh, and just everything's kind of worked out with this horse. And it's truly incredible, you know, throughout this horse's whole career. We gave him one 30 day break in December. I 
Paul Dwayne, and I just felt we were at such a crucial time in his career that if we didn't give him a break, you know, the Derby trail was going to be off the line. It, we we're just asking so much that he was going to make it after the two-year-old campaign that he was put on that I said, you know, we just have to give this horse a break if we want to put ourselves in a position to be in contention. And we knew the timing would be extremely close. We were cutting it very, very close. Uh, we sent him to Texas to Highlander Training Center, which is a facility I've used over the years. Uh, Jeff Hooper runs it. It's an um, amazing facility. They do such a great job. We gave him 30 days off uh, just of turnout, put him right back into training at Highlander where he was able to get works under him to be prepared going back into the track. Um, and then right when he got back, back into Wayne, he was at Oaklawn and he was able to work. And I believe he only worked four times before he ran in that first comeback race at Oaklawn at the track. And I was sitting there, I was like, gosh, there, there's just no way he can be ready. And the way he ran fresh was, was just so impressive. And I, at that moment, I knew we had a serious horse because to do what he did that day was, was ultra impressive. And I think that was the key that gave me so much confidence going in the Pennsylvania Derby by skipping the Travers and giving him that time in between races. I truly believe that's what he needed. And now he got six weeks to the Breeders' Cup. He's, he's training great. I, I just think he's sitting on a big effort. Whether he's good enough, we're going to find out. But I think he's going to run a big effort. Wow, Joe. I mean, this is what's so fun about being involved in my racehorses. Just even hearing you speak, you've got a whole team of people that are just at the top of their game collaborating with guys like Lucas and yourself behind a horse when you invest. It's just, it gets so fun. And I, I, I was curious, you, you said you're liking his workouts coming into this. What, what would it mean to you if he were to win this? And, you know, look, there's a few championships potentially, Joe, on the line. This is a very strange year in racing with championships, right? Uh, right now, the big two front runners for Horse of the Year are Torpedo Anna and Fierceness. But look, Fierceness throws in clunkers. Torpedo Anna, that's a tough field. I know Idiomatic scratched this morning, but I, I, that horse from Japan looks nice. And then after that, Cogburn, you know, he, he's yeah, a, yeah. a turf sprinter, but, you know, they don't tend to give it to them. All I'm saying, I'm, I'm not saying he, he's Horse of the Year, but there's a path. There's a path to your horse being horse of the year champion three-year-old, right? Absolutely. I mean, when you look back, uh, he's four for eight this year with three graded stakes and two grade ones. If you could add a third grade one in the Breeders' Cup, I, he, he's putting up a big fight to put him up for himself, regardless what happens in the, in the, the other categories. So it's it's pretty amazing when you look back and we get so lost in the moment that you kind of forget everything else he did this year. And it's it's incredible. His chances, obviously, I think he has a great shot. I think personally, he's, you can't count this guy out. Um, are you looking at it the same way? No, I, absolutely. I, I, in my opinion, I, I don't think it's the strongest race. I think it's ultra competitive. I think you could make a case for six horses in the field that if they bring their A game, um, you know, they can win. But I, we always thought after he won the Pat Day mile, even when he won the Preakness, that maybe a mile was going to be his best game. Uh, obviously, he went on to win the Penn Derby longer. And when he gets that lonely, comfortable lead going long, he can absolutely extend himself and go further. Uh, but I think he's he's got tactical speed where he can put himself involved in the race. Uh, they're going to get pace to run into. Uh, and I, like I said, I just think when he's fresh and he's feeling good and the work that I saw on Wednesday – he went 113 and changed without even being asked. And he's just a picture of health right now that I think he's going to bring his A game. One last thing on him. He has brought so many people so much joy. He's really the people's horse, Joe. Um, sure. is, is there any chance that you guys might consider running him next year, depending on things go? I know, I know that it looks probably not, but I'm thinking the Pegasus or something like every time he runs, it's so fun. Is, is there any, any chance? I'm frank. Yeah. You know, I, I won't count it out. Uh, I don't think it's a, it's a complete zero, but um, I think a lot of things would have to, you know, go in a perfect order. Of course, you know, we have, he had got a stud deal with Gainesway farm and now they're a major player in, in his future. Uh, deservingly so they put up the money. Um, and regardless what path happens, he's, he's going to have a, a great next 2025, whether it's in the shed um, or on the racetrack. And, and like you said, the Pegasus is something that we could consider where he could run next year and still go into the breeding season and have enough time. 
Uh, so I definitely wouldn't count that race off the table. Wow, Joe. Well, this is so exciting. And just like there's a bright future for, uh, for Seize the Gray, whether it's on the track or the breeding shed or, or Straight No Chaser or Improbable Luck, there's a bright future for my racehorse as long as Joe Moran's there. And we are so yeah. grateful to have had your, your, your insights and your time today. We, we would love to do it again. And thank you so, so much. Oh, absolutely. Uh, looking forward to doing it again. Thank you, Joe. All right, great stuff this week uh, with Joe Moran there, Ryan. And, you know, it's funny as, uh, you know, talking with Joe, talking about managers, right? Just tell everybody real quick kind of what Joe really does. It's more about, you know, picking these right things. Like trainers are out there working the horses, but Joe has a very important job, uh, specifically when it comes to my racehorse, but in general of what he brings to horse racing. Oh, yeah. I mean, look, it takes a whole team to, yeah. to find the right horse, to to help a horse make it to the track. It's not just you, you throw him into a trainer's arms and it's done. There's grooms, there's hot walkers. And look, Joe's, in my opinion, he's a, he's a legend at this point. He is the guy who actually found Sees the Gray. Mm. I mean, in fact, when we were interviewing him uh, the, the day before, he was like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, it's hard to reach me. I'm out here looking at horses at Ocala. I mean, this guy is is as good as it gets, Matt. And so, you know, racing manager, he's in charge of so many things for my racehorse. Um, but really what you're getting a chance to see here is this is a man who knows how to find success. He found it with, with Seize the Gray. Finding a, a tr any horse who can win a triple crown level race just shows you know what you're looking for. And this is what you're getting into with Improbable Luck. He was found found by this man, Joe Moran. And, and it just gives you hope that when you put your money down to invest in my racehorse horse, you're you're in the big big leagues with people who know what they do they're doing and and how exciting could it be if you know Moran's found a, a needle in a haystack before maybe ours is the next one you know and that's what you're hoping every time you partner up with these things. Horse we do want to spotlight. So part of the podcast we're going to obviously discuss a lot, but a horse that we want to spotlight for my racehorse and a guy that is expected to be on the Kentucky Derby Trail next year is a horse named Caldera. Ryan, tell us everybody everything that you need to know about Caldera. Oh my gosh, talk about excitement! If you own a fractional share of this horse, you got to be thrilled. So th there were whispers. This is a my racehorse horse. This means you could have you could have bought into him. Um, that there are whispers this could be a horse on the Kentucky Derby Trail next year for D. Wayne Lucas, the same uh, trainer that trains Improbable Luck and sees the gray. Um, so, in fact, let me read you a quote here, Matt. This was exciting. Uh, this was released from My Racehorse. On October 1st, My Racehorse reported that Lucas said, it looks like you've done it again. Of course, referring to grade one Preakness and Pennsylvania Derby winner sees the gray. Mm. Lucas noted that Caldera possesses a particularly impressive combination of speed and stamina. And at this stage, he expects him to make an impact on the 2025 Kentucky Derby trail or the triple crown trail in general is what the quote says here, but uh, he's worked out five times. He's, he's as of this taping, he has a series of bullet works, meaning he was the fastest horse to train at this distance on the day. So guys, keep an eye on Caldera. Uh, it'll be fun to see how he progresses as we follow his My Racer's journey uh, here on Talk and Track. And who knows, a year from now, Matt, maybe we'll be talking at the Breeders' Cup, uh, which race is Caldera entering in? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which, which race is Improbable Luck entering in? You know, hope springs eternal in this game. Just making it to the racetrack, you've overcome the odds. And uh, I'm, I'm so excited for all of you watching because we're all in this together and I'm excited to follow all these horses as we, we move forward with our dreams and in their careers. Absolutely. And final thing to kind of wrap up, which I want to do for my resource, the ones that are available. So a lot of the horses that we have discussed are already kind of purchased up. Some of the ones you go to myracehorse.com right now. Stylishly is there. Spanks a million. Malibu Bonnie and Elite Heat are some of the horses right now that you can get involved in. We'll talk about some of them on future shows as well. Uh, but Ryan, this was so much fun. Not the last episode that we're going to get here talking track as we kind of move forward. Breeders' Cup's going to be awesome. I know you're going, man. Have a fantastic time. We'll get plenty of content there. And good luck to all the My Race Horse horses that'll be running there. It's going to be really awesome. Good stuff. Appreciate everybody joining us for this edition of Talking Track.